for you, sir. All right. Good. And hopefully other faculty who comes, uh, please uh, join because next 45 minutes we'll show this case and then we'll continue our uh, presentation. I think the Greg Stone's presentation is the next one. Uh, but the Harvey, but uh, Burkhoff lecture is really uh, tremendous for understanding the hemodynamics. Really, uh, superb. So with that note, uh, this is the case, 63-year-old uh, male who presented in end of January with anterior wall STEMI at outside hospital, hypotension, EF of 30%. At that time, CATH revealed three vessel disease and patient was had a balloon pump done uh, and was optimized and referred for cabbage. Then it was declined. After heart team discussion, I'll show you what regions were. But basically, patient was not clearly in hype, cardio in shock, but hypotension, heart failure uh, presented there. Risk factors wise, all were okay, but he is uncontrolled insulin requiring diabetes. His A1C was 8.6 uh, and uh, he still smokes. Uh, EF continued to remain. Uh, the few EFs have been between 30 to 37 percent. Then echo also showed LV apical thrombus. So for which patient was started on warfarin. So patient has been on warfarin since uh, uh, I would say January 29th, 30th until few days ago uh, or that when we brought him here, we did the echo and echo showed no LV thrombus but ejection fracture of 32%. So this is patient with the three vessel. We'll show you that uh, on the angiogram point of view. Uh, show the cat now. No. Yeah, so left system, you can see significant uh, two tandem lesions, 95% in the proxel AD. If you see majority of the vessel is ectatic and calcium you can see in the wall of uh, mid LAD, proximal circumflex, and then you have a large OM with another 90% lesion. So this is just to show fluoroscopy calcium, mm -hmm. but the calcium is not at the lesion in LAD mm -hmm. and this is a right coronary artery which is moderate size but a significant disease uh, after the RV branch in the mid RCA and this is where our LV graph is. EDP was about 20. So, so basically actually when we uh, brought the patient uh, although this was a kind of uh, uh, issue always happens when you uh, think whether randomized or not randomized. It's ideal case for Protect 4, except now with the new criteria, and I hope uh, Greg Stone comes on. We actually have, I don't know what yours, uh, Amir, the last, uh, in two months, my five cases, which could have been the Protect 4 cases were excluded because EF was 32, 33 percent, 31, 32, 33 percent. And I know with the new criteria of 30, it's really affecting us. I know Protect, uh, in a Protect 2, it was 35 percent and the left, you know, three vessel disease, uh, 30 and left main was 35. But now this 30 percent EF really has uh, dampened the enrollment of uh, in the Protect uh, 4 trial. So this case, again, ejection fraction being 32 percent is not part of the, but although I, I was ready to take the chance that although whether this case would have been, let's say, randomized to a control arm, we would put a balloon pump uh, and uh, and good thing was there was no LV thrombus. So the first qualified for the case uh, for the Protect 4, we were still could have randomized, but because of the ejection fraction could not randomize and patient is here with the low EF with multi-vessel disease uh, to be taken care. So Anu, tell us what you had decided and while we'll speak about. So, so uh, we'll do the impeller insertion live. We already have a pigtail there. Groin. Ah, okay, yes, the groin you can see uh, pre-closed done by uh, Manish here. Mm -hmm. And then we have the impellers sheet already so two inserted. Pre -closes? Yes. So what about uh, two, uh, one pre-closed and one then NG seal in the end? Uh, what is your preference? What you have been doing, Amir? Yeah, so... We do very similar. We do upfront uh, pre-close with two, and we use the uh, PCI. We don't do single access PCI. We use the PCI site at the end to do a balloon tamponade and completion angiography. Are you going to do single access, Dr. Sharma and Dr. Yeah. Kenny? Or are you yeah. going to do two? Yeah, we actually, you know what, we still, uh, with the single access, although we got one case a little trouble, but overall we have been using a single access, and now they brought the new sheet. Uh, the Abiomed has the a new sheet, sheet. companion sheet. We'll show it, but yes, yeah, sir. we are, unless we see that there is a trouble in the guide engagement, because you know that clearly one, why using the one, your movement of the guide is very hampered. 
Uh, so therefore, if they, the trouble will be with the guide engagement, then we'll do, definitely go with the counter letter puncture. But otherwise, we are doing all cases with a single axis. Dr. Sharma, I noticed in your presentation, you mentioned the patient had LV thrombus. It was presumably treated and resolved, correct? That's it, correct. So patient was put on warfarin. And uh, when we brought yesterday, that was a little risk for us. Whether, But I have another case. If this could have LV thrombus, we have another patient today. Uh, also complex CAD. Uh, we would have selected that patient. But this case actually, I thought that since no LV thrombus will be a good case for a Protect 4. Can they show but the insertion now? No. Okay, show the camera now on the top, please. So, so there was a red sheath. Uh, please. Can we see the top camera? Yeah. Okay, yeah, you see so it now. See there, good. No, they're not seeing it, yeah. Okay, now they yeah, can see. Yeah, we see the impella about to go yeah. in, yes? Yeah. Yes. It's going to bleed a little bit from the pump site and where the insertion just go in fast. Yes. Now we are good. Okay. And I mentioned many people actually just want to go without the wire, but we have always gone with the wire. I agree. He should yeah. use the wire. Yeah. Yes. So now it will be sitting as a pigtail, short monorail. Looks good. And now the tech will start. Yes. Any so we have heparin that? and ACT is about 308. All large bore access, heparin is the best. Good. Kenny, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kenny, what in your cases, do you, I noticed you talked about the contrast uh, based on the fluoroscopy. Are you doing uh, imaging on all of your cases or selective? Selected cases only. Uh, so this is just, we are trying to show fellows that uh, I know nowadays all the teaching is uh, imaging, 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 but I think we, we here, Maybe our imaging right now <clears throat> is between 22 to 24%. Most often is, uh, you know, optimization. Left main PCI, definitely we are doing imaging uh, pre and post, but most of the others are any complex procedures and uh, all the live cases are with the imaging. Where I would say, where you definitely have to do young patient, proxel ready, then patients who are pre-op, ready to go for uh, some kind of a surgery, any non-cardiac surgery, and you want to sh stop the DAP after a month, despite uh, the current uh, newer generation stents, I think it's good to make sure there's a, a proper optimization of the stents after uh, PCI. That's definitely we are doing the imaging. But here, I think uh, what we are trying to show is that if you have angiographically moderate to severe calcium, severe calcium is tram track, where we have seen here, you could yes. do um, any, any kind of atherectomy without uh, using imaging. Okay. The reason we, we I will ask show, yeah, is, we definitely uh, will show. We'll want to. I, there is a see slightly decreased flow in the LED, uh, and that was the part of that was the site of the STEMI. So that's a culprit vessel. Others are non-culprit, and uh, so. You are saying something, Amir, the point with the imaging? Okay, now we go back. Let's do the insertion, yeah. then you can, yeah. So we are about, to... can you show here again? Yeah. Go focus more. Yeah. Around so one o'clock. Uh, showing you a single access technique with the new companion sheet. So they use the micropuncture needle and the micropuncture wire. And there's four quadrants you could stick it in, as uh, Dr. Kinney just did and she'll change out for a 35 wire and deliver the companion sheet, which is an Abiumed uh, engineered and specifically designed for this purpose sheet that is, uh, I think we just recently released a few weeks ago. Yeah. We are used, uh, like this will be our third uh, case, but it definitely make a little slippery. I, I think it's a better uh, compared to what we have been using before. Okay, so 35 wire has been advanced. Dr. Uh, Dr. Stone has joined us and he Good. asked me if this was a protect four and I explained to him your soliloquy about the EF being 32%. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, I mean, every case I'm moderating uh, for you yeah. lately has an EF yeah. of 31 or 32%. <laughs> and that is what I was actually asking. The question comes uh, is that why, you know, remember you're on protect four, or protect two, you are 35 and 30, 35, three vessel, 30 with the left main. The, and now you made 30. I know that a lot of cases have been done between that group. Is there any, and I'm sure you have, other centers are feeling it also. 
in last i would say two months five cases have been declined because ef was between 31 and 33 percent <clears throat> Rick, could you well, also, could you also talk about why the change? Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, we were getting, uh, you know, initially Protect4 was enrolling patients with the Echo Core Lab confirmed EF of less than or equal to 40%, but we wanted consecutive patients and especially high risk patients. Uh, and we were anticipating an overall um, uh, median EF of around 28%. And it turns out that it seemed like there was a higher proportion of patients above 30% that were being enrolled. I can't say whether or not that was selective enrollment or that's what sites were seeing, but regardless, the median EF was, in, was running higher than we wanted. And so we said, okay, that bucket of higher EF patients is filled and we now just need lower EF patients. So, but Samin, it's okay. You're still number one in enrollment. Yeah, so, but I can uh, tell you, I want to question is, is there any chance for 35 or it will just remain 30? No, it's, it's going to stay 30. And the, uh, the EF is, is, is now drifting down again. So that's good. That's good. Yes. So we expect to finish enrollment by the end of the year. So uh, keep looking for those patients. We appreciate it. And you know, sometimes when you're 31 or 32, um, the core lab might actually read it as less than 30. So actually, you can send those films to the core lab. We've had at least two cases like that already I from other hospitals. Shot, no? No. Okay, so good. You know, that's a good point, actually. Uh, we'll do this case was a little unusual. The reason was uh, he came with the LV thrombus, but that thrombus wasn't there. So we thought maybe it will be a case or not. Uh, and uh, But, the, you know, we'll give it a try. And yes, the dis little discrepancy of the EF between our lab and the core lab, we saw it in our earlier cases. I think we'll, rather than, uh, you know, same thing, that case of the CRT, uh, rather than we just count our EF, I think we just will uh, try with the core lab. Because it's you know subjective one or two percent, and I know that they are the uniform ones. So let me just complete the presentation, and then they are ready for the OCT or so. Let's go back quickly. So that our plan will be now uh, is uh, supported high risk PCI of multiple lesions with the OCT guidance for OA use. Question is there is a calcium, severe calcium, but it seems to be on angiogram in the area of non obstruction, ectatic area calcified. True lesion in both circumflex and LED are uh, at the site of the lesion. There is no calcium. Uh, so basically, as we so these all cases, we go through up uh, in terms of the heart team discussion, STS risk score, syntax score, and uh, calculation. This patient syntax of 35. STS was 5.2 at that time. So I'm sure it is low now. It will be probably three because that time patient was just about pre-cardiogenic shock, had a balloon pump. That's why STS score was that high. But if you take a STS score now, uh, probably will be a less than three, and five is kind of a cutoff. And this is where three vessel disease, two or three, a patient has one vessel, uh, I mean one uh, beta blocker, and after heart team discussion, I call it a class one indication. And of course, a patient with a low EF, and this has been an issue, whether you use a cabbage or a PCI, mm -hmm. uh, and this is a, one of the big issue, is the, our algorithm which we have made combination of uh, low EF and complex CAD. And this is, I think, uh, this is what uh, we wanted to talk about. The 40% has now become 30%. And uh, this will be the major trial. Uh, probably, as Greg just mentioned, end enrollment, end of the year. And the last case has to one year follow up. So the results will be, will be probably at the mid 26th because they'll require entire 25th as a follow up and the results will be probably somewhere in the uh, beginning of second quarter of the 26th. Right, Greg? Right, yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're shooting for ACC 2026, so keep it rolling. Okay, okay. okay. so, so let's Dr. Go to Sharma, yeah. how, how in, in your practice and you and Dr. Kinney, uh, are you guys uh, trying to target a, a specific uh, residual syntax score? I think we, there's a lot of data now that if we could get it below eight, the patients do better. Do you guys take that into yeah. consideration or you just yeah. try to do as much as you can? No, I'm, I think it's the same. The only lesion which we will be a little hesitant is that uh, the, the CTO supplying the, uh, our angiographic point of view, like a dead myocardium, you know, severe LV yeah. dysfunction and CTO, that will not. But every other vessel, uh, goal is that let's try to open it in the real life as well as in the trial. And that is what we have done in the protect also so that uh, even with some cases in the protect group. It's good. Uh, yeah, could you check the path from the guide? 
from the guy. Uh, that Check those the patients uh, came back for stage, uh, and the stage intervention in our group yeah, has, for, had been okay. similar for both. One okay, second. let's show the OCT Can on the screen injected? first. Okay. They're doing the OCT just to show the calcium which we saw. And I'm going to enable. I'm going to enable. Oh, sure, sure. I don't touch. Good. It's very. Okay, go on the floor. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wish we, I wish we had you know better data to know what to do with viability. Yeah, um, you know the the stitch viability sub study no we didn't get was it. was negative, we didn't get it. and 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 you we, know we in, in get, stitch they revascularized patients just because they had coronary disease, not even if they had active ischemia. Okay, you viability, do it. No viability. No, sure, sure, sure. One second, one second. Yeah. And uh, patients improved whether or not they had viability or not. So, so Dan, what do you think? Is, uh, is viability a great concept? Are our tools not good enough? Should we listen to the results of viability or should we try to revascularize everything if it's not too complex, even if it goes to non-viable myocardium and patients with reduced EF? I, I really think it's the tools. I don't think that we have the right way. But the concept is... is yeah. Okay, totally can you try it? Okay, okay. Scope, okay. Want to, and, I, I, I will right. enable. I want to revascularize oh. it, but the tools are not... Can you break one second? Yeah, uh, unless it yeah, serves as a collateral check. source to yeah. other areas, which was always oh. the... Possible theory. Yeah, perfect, uh, perfect image. That's a good image. Yeah. So as it relates to imaging, I know that uh, Dr. Kenny said it's selective. Uh, just to know, just to see the fellows know, we have an initiative right now in Michigan. You know, if you talk to everybody, everybody says they image 100%. Uh, but in Michigan, we have a database that's run by Blue Cross Blue Shield, and it turns out only 15% of cases we were imaging. There's a new pay for performance measure uh, metric that started in January of 24 for all hospitals and the new um, criteria is your hospital has to do 40% of all PCIs and above 90% of all left main proximal LAD. So uh, even the payers are starting to see the value of imaging. Yeah, so, I know, think 40% is just... a good number. I was thinking about 35, but I think 40% is a good number. Yes. Okay, Kiski, so, what so do you see there? Yeah, sure. Can I show you the OCT imaging? Yeah. Yeah, okay, I'll show you from start of the proximal part, now coming to the distal. Like uh, this is a proximal titus part. This is log attenuation, but it's not calcium. It's a lipid plug at the proximal part. And come go more distally. It looks like kind of old uh, disrupted, like an old rupture plug. But here is also no calcium. When we go more distally, yeah. Now I see like a kind of a 90 degree calcium, like level up like here after the lesion, but not severe calcium. But when we go to more distally, yeah. Now comes a lot of calcium here. So. As you told, yeah, like, calcium, uh, but it's not obstructive. Yeah, yeah. You, as you told, uh, our tightest lesion is not not that calcified. Yeah. <laughs> so as angiographically felt that there is some calcium in that ectactic area, but there is a no, no obstruction at that level. But uh, uh, earlier, that ulcerated rupture plaque, I am on the 27th, uh, Greg, I know you came a little late. The 27th uh, January, this patient presented to outside hospital with the pre shock. Uh, they put a balloon pump, stabilized and uh, just what managed medically uh, with the LV thrombus gave uh, warfarin. And now then of course, after surgical discussion decline and we brought the patient here. So that time I'm mm. sure it was a nice, maybe total or subtotal occlusion of that LED, which is still have a slightly lower flow. Uh, Timmy minus Timmy three, but not uh, Timmy three three, but uh, Timmy, more than Timmy two flow, uh, probably has some thrombus, have a good ACT. Patient actually was loaded on clopedigrel and we did a PRU, whatever the worst we know, the, usually in the, it does not help much. 193. Yeah, it's a 193, but in the diabetic patient, I would definitely will change it to a more potent uh, antiplatelet therapy. Usually, if we are working on CTOs and so, so we do start with the clopidogrel, but then we change it to rapidly to uh, either presagul or um, ticagrel, or uh, presagul is the one which we prefer as a stronger agent, and many of those cases give a 5 milligram uh, after the loading dose rather than 10 milligram, 10 milligram we reserve for people more than 100 kilo. And this is where, where our Jack intervention and uh, Euro intervention, all the papers, we have emphasized the outcome with a five milligram and 10 milligram uh, of uh, maintenance dose that clearly the five milligram has a lower bleeding, no difference in mace or stent thrombosis. <laughs> Right, the five milligram dose gives you pretty uh, equal potent yeah. effects to clopidogrel, although it's more consistent without the variability in genetic response. Ten milligrams, of course, is, is much more potent. Okay, three five twenty balloon. Yeah. Yep. 
And a okay, like... so based on this now, no no orbital attract me in yeah, this particular case. So we are just going to go with the balloon and... Uh, and give us a 4038, Zions. So, so Samin, I wanted to ask uh, yeah. you and Anu and, and Amir, uh, I, as you know, we just published this um, latest meta-analysis in uh, Lancet showing yep. that intravascular imaging actually reduces all-cause mortality, all myocardial infarction. Uh, it, its effects are really profound. So if that's enough to move it to class one in the guidelines, what are you going to do with intravascular imaging? So I think yeah, I can tell. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I a big, I'm a big... I personally am a big believer, and yes. uh, probably over 90% of our cases, uh, mine personally, I do yeah, imaging. I think there's a lot of compelling data, renovate the meta-analysis, there's I mean, randomized that's data. White, white, that so I'm like hoping a, that this next generation of operators, particularly the fellows, uh, there's a lot of resistance with the older vintage of operators, and they do it more selectively. But I think for as young people in the room, you guys should no, really get in the habit of doing it routinely. That's my opinion. So question is routine. How does it affect your how does it affect your decision making what you do? I, I can tell you every time we image it's actionable. For example, on this particular case, we would have the vessel prep, so the morphology we saw, the distal landing zone, where you want to land the stent. Yeah. What about the distal vessel size? Is it different than the proximal? Do you need to optimize? So anytime you do imaging, particularly a priori, not just to optimize or to show apposition, it really helps yeah. you. It just makes the procedure, you know, very you know, very scripted. And I think that you're gonna re you know, reduce yeah. a lot of the variability that we see with operators if we all did imaging. So it's both planning and optimization. Yeah, you, you end up using, all studies show, you end up using longer stents, um, larger stents, uh, larger post dilatation balloons. You cover disease that you weren't necessarily planning on covering. And again, the biggest difference is that you get a larger minimal stent area. I agree with all that. So at ACC in a couple weeks, there's gonna be another big randomized trial of um, IVIS versus angiography guidance that is applicable to this patient in particular. And it's called IVIS ACS. And it was just in patients with uh, recent STEMI, non-STEMI, and unstable angina, 3,550 randomized patients. So uh, I'll alert you to that presentation. We're doing a stable patient a population right now. We're randomizing in the improved trial. Right. Oh, just yeah. 38 and more to normal. Really 38. Easy 38. To 33. Yep. 4033. Yeah, so I have the clearly the data keep uh, accumulating in this favor and more. And what I also learned is that after these the 2023 randomized trials in the imaging complication, people always say, you know what, there could be some complication. And it was surprised to see that all the trials, there's like no complication related to image. Correct. Yeah, it's very, very low. It's probably, it's probably not zero, but it's like 0.2%. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and most of them are, you know, I mean, it's a moderate dissection or something. I mean, it's not severe. So I wanted to ask Anu, um, you know, Anu in our meta-analysis, we, we showed that OCT and IVIS seem to have very similar results. How do you decide when you're going to use um, OCT versus IVIS? So uh, every, it depends on the kind of patient most important I think would be a patient's creatinine. Like here today we have a creatinine of uh, 0.7. We're still a believer of using dye rather than uh, you know non-dye uh, OCT. So that's and of course like I said the number one criteria where here in Sinai every left main I mean we do about close to 300 yeah. unprotected left main per year is done with uh, imaging and uh, that's why we are uh, IVAS driven, but otherwise, yes, um, we are OCT driven, especially yeah. understanding calcium. Yep. Yes. <clears throat> and I, I'm uh, just to be on the other side of the imaging, right? Um, I know we are telling of the current fellows, imaging, 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 but I think you need to train your eyes also how to do this procedure without uh, uh, imaging. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you fully. You can use OCT for distal left main bifurcations. Yeah. It works beautifully. But if anywhere you're close to the osteum, then that's a real advantage for IVIS. Let's post it. Yeah. Yeah. 4, 4, 4, 30. 430 high pressure balloon. So this we put a 4038. Uh, sorry, 33, right? 33. Yeah, yeah. 4033. Um, the Zions. Yes. And then we are going to post dilate with a 40. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we'll do a 
OCT now I'm still concerned in that area. Remember the calcium, although very ectatic. Mm. Uh, that what we are going to learn. Okay. Yeah. High pressure. Huh? Yep. Yeah. High pressure. And like you see, if you have good uh, pre uh, anticoagulation antiplatelet therapy, you see no slow flow. Usually you expect that there will be a slow flow, uh, more of a uh, distal microvasculature. Uh, obstruction, right. embolization, nothing happened in this particular case. So we gave, you know, many times we do give some uh, vasodilator beforehand, uh, although with a low EF, we try to avoid it. Then use nipride as needed. Uh, so, Samin, are you are using Cangrelor in any of these cases? You know, that really gives you 99% of, uh, you know, P2Y12 associated platelet inhibition. So it's stronger than both Prasagrel and Ticagrelor. I think this case could be the case also because of the slower flow uh, in the LED no. in the post MI. But yeah, just coming back to the point, I think the practice is a little different everywhere. Uh, we are not using routinely, but our use... Uh, Definitely not for uh, stable cases. Yeah, the, I, I mean, it's not truly right. stable. I mean, yeah. it's still within four... Oh. Actually, now you're right. It's six weeks of uh, the original event. So this is not a truly stable patient. So, it's the post MI. 20. Yeah. So, so yeah, case, our use is about 10-12%. But I know a lot of the centers may be using more, but we are about 10 to 12 percent uh, uh, use of uh, IV Kangrelor. We, we reserve the use really unless the patients come in with ACS, yeah. high risk patients, cardiogenic right. shock, people who can't get the medication safely and, uh, and quickly enough. The other just one more comment about imaging. Um, Dr. Uh, Kenny and Dr. Sharma, do you guys uh, find that the barrier to imaging is always time, and particularly in a very busy lab like this one here at Mount Sinai? But I will tell you that the more you do it, the more efficient it gets. So, Beef. and the other thing is a lot of people don't know what they're looking at, image interpretation. So those are the two big barriers. Do you guys have someone that helps you with image interpretation? We do at our lab, or do you guys do it yourself? No, this no we do. Yeah, we have a team. We have Kiski here. He's uh, actually came here as a postdoc uh, fellow from uh, Japan, but now he stayed as a faculty. He's one of our faculty here now. For you have seen him for every live cases, so he's uh, here day and night teaching the fellows and everything. So we have a dedicated team. Of right, course, so we do camera. all the. We have to show <clears throat> Kiski's picture. We always have Kiske. one or two Japanese uh, kids. I mean, I call them kids, but uh, they are very matured. Uh, Can we ju just focus on Kiski, please? Uh, so we always have one to two, but you are right. You need a dedicated person. So even 10 o'clock doing the IWAS. So he's the right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So all the papers are coming with that. So key is the setup. And then at no, least no, let me answer. Yeah. So yeah. what happens? You are right. You need a dedicated uh, person to do that mm -hmm. and image interpretation. And of course, you know, we have both. Um, uh, uh, Octade as well as uh, Iversaid. We have these apps where you have several images and teaching everything from basic to all the complex, uh, uh, you know, email anatomies, how to see it and how to understand imaging. Imaging interpretation is a key. Uh, uh, of course, I think when you go to all these courses, you will also learn how to interpret. And sometimes you see something and you don't know what to do about it. That's also there. So we are actually in this uh, uh, octaves, we have the, where you can upload these uh, images, send it to us, and we can, we'll reply within 24 hours if you have any questions wow. like that. But a team is a key. I would say the team for uh, imaging, team for uh, uh, physiology, and you need also a team for closure, uh, access and closure. And the most yeah. important, the education point of view, I think both uh, Greg and you, uh, Amir, emphasize on that. So I think it's uh, clearly is a new way of doing the intervention. We did our Correct. fellowship, we did our work, we never needed, uh, I mean, or let's say very rarely needed. And even now, I mean, if you ask me that which case, Dr. Sharma, you will not do without IWAS, I say zero, without imaging, I mean, IWAS or OCT. The yeah. question is, I tell fellows that, guys, you do extra. Right now, we have three fellows working today with us, Manish, Rakhi, and Anton. So I we encouraging guys, keep show the fellows' faces also. So we always tell them, that you need to think about. Now, rest uh, our staff, the RNs are Will and Alina and uh, CVT, Asif and Habib, they all are constant uh, people, kind of, uh, for all the live cases which are come out from Sinai. But biggest, to me, is stimulus for the eye, the imaging, intracoronary imaging has to come by the junior uh, faculty. And because, you know, same, 
The, for us, you know, we can do without, but that does not mean. Now we know that you can improve your better outcome, and we know that we did it, but we never had any trouble. That does not mean that you can't improve any further, and particularly for the younger generation. So we always emphasize uh, for them uh, to be more proactive and get ready, because clearly that if you, after the case has started and now you're saying, I do I was or so, I will say, forget it, let's just finish it. But if you're right. planned, you're ready, yes, do it. I agree. Yeah, and that's that, that's what, those are also the points that you know we made in the article that now I mean you've got a mortality reduction, correct? And it's long term. It's not it's not that it gets you out of the cath lab. You're going to get out of the cath lab without IBIS or OCT, but it it you know reduces long term rates of stent thrombosis, myocardial infarction, target vessel revascularization, and cardiac death in particular. So the emphasis really has to shift to training. Um, to learn how to do it quickly and efficiently, and also better reimbursement. Um, but it's, it's uh, for me, I, I mean, it takes all the guesswork out of the procedure. You're yeah. not squinting and going, is that a 2.5 or a 3.0? Oh, and, and is it a 33 millimeter stand or 30, 28 or 38? Right. You know, I mean, it, it gives you all the information. It's, right. it's science as opposed to anecdote. You know, anecdote and guesswork. So it, it may add five minutes per case, but it's, it's well worth it. What are you going to do next, Dr. Okay. Kenny? We are ready for the OCT. We actually placed a 4-O strength. Then we post-dilated already with the 4-O at 20 atmospheres. So we'll just confirm with the OCT if everything is, is it well optimized. Do we need to post-dilate? And then we'll do the OCT. So, the so Anu, do you, do you, do you post-dilate routinely? Every calcific lesion, yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, here, the reason for post-dilation, this was not, I mean, where the lesion was, it was not calcific, but there was a lot a lot of ectasia, so we had to calcific. Prox LED, Prox RCA, Prox circumflex, and left, I mean, all of those, as yeah. well as, of course, left main, we have to optimize, separate. So I think the question to uh, you, uh, Greg, so your point, that if you know the vessel size already with your pre, so you know that you will need to, if you are, uh, when we do a balloon of that size or extent, your moderate pressure may not be Good fully. Right? So okay. there's no reason to do that IVAS or OCT in between. Optimize and then you finish it. Good, right? Yeah, the image. Okay. Look, I can, I will enable. Okay, you start. Okay, okay. one second. Oh. Enabling, one second. Calculating, one second. Yeah, please, Cine, inject. Yeah, beautiful image. Good image. I'm checking. Okay, bring the screen and the OCT on the main there. Okay, yeah, good. And you put a wire in the circle. Yep. Same wire. OCT. Let's see. Yeah, if it looks wire. good, I will go with the same yeah, wire. So this is the upgraded version of Lutron 2. So first I do the angio correlation. Yeah. Check the guide position and the end of the pullback. And it's thinking it's an AI integrated. It will tell you that uh, calcium arc or lumen or uh, lead area. Okay, it, I got the image. So fast, I checked the distal edge. So still native lesion, come to proximal. Yeah, this is just the uh, proximal, uh, distal edge. Looks very well expanded, and uh, no edge dissection, no, no, and uh, no malla position. Yeah. Now come to the proximal. Yeah, stent is all well expanded. Like area is like almost like a 10, 11. Now come to the proximal. Yeah, the, the tightest part is well expanded without atelectomy. Well expanded, and a proximal edge is just at the bifurcation. Beautiful. And, uh, yeah, and uh, no malabsorption, no dissection. It's a perfect have, result. We didn't even have to post dilate that. No, we did. Well, no, we did. We did. We did. We did. This was post dilate. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah. Was done, done, done. So that is yeah. And so, I, I would agree with you. I'd routinely post dilate yeah. unless you do OCT after yeah. or, or IVUS after first yeah. putting in the stent and then see that you don't need to. But you know, about sixty percent of stents are underexpanded after they're put in, and you can't tell angiographically. Correct. So just either routinely post dilate no. or, or, or serially okay. image. Which one you are going to want to? That that looks terrific. That looks just like a great result. Yes. Proximal circle. Point. And, and, and you don't worry covering the circle a little bit. That's okay. fine. You can see it was the circle was wide open. Yeah, they get plenty access. So yeah, it's true. That's... No, aren't we doing the OM? Yeah, OM we are doing, but question is where we do that. I don't think you need image no. of the circle. No way. Okay. Oh. Yeah, so I think uh, <laughs> part of that, uh, you know, today we thought will be a calcific lesion, which was the other one. Uh, but this case uh, we felt will be more interesting, uh, knowing that there was no LV thrombus. Uh, it seems to be, as I said, calcium, but less calcium. I mean, no calcium at the site of stenosis. 
Here there is a angiographically. Yeah. See it again. See the little calcium proximally, but nothing distally. So here. So let's do this one also. Uh, more important. Uh, we know that the lesion there is no calcium. Get a 2.515 high pressure balloon there. Uh, and uh, so we probably you know there is a mild disease at the ostium of that OM. We'll see angio OCT wise where it is because if, we, if it's a good lumen, don't uh, do anything because then you'll compromise the distal cirque. Uh, and then the proximal circ, uh, calcium, and what is the lumen? Uh, those are the important points we are going to interrogate with this OCT now. From the uh, hemodynamic point of view, this patient, of course, has been very stable. Yes. How are you managing the impella during this now? Is it at a low speed? At seven? Auto, Auto mode, but usually what? In the P7 or P6? What? P7. Yep. The, so P6. Yeah, P7 with the output 3.6. So nothing needed to be done. And this case was not the low EDP. EDP was 20. 20. Yeah, yeah. 20 plus. So that uh, so so far fully managed. Uh, Some and, uh, yeah, please check that. Uh, Do you see it? Yeah, could you check again, please? So we have yeah, a good, new good. Um, OCT One rule I'm about enabling. when you need lesion preparation. I've seen it in, uh, recently published, and it's the rule of threes. Okay, so it's inject. three quarter, three quadrant calcium, Correct. three millimeters yep. longer or Beautiful more, image. and 0.3 millimeters deep okay. of calcium. Um, those are the ones where you really need lesion preparation uh, with either atherectomy or IVL. While they're doing the image interpretation, just a quick comment on the hemodynamics. The so you notice uh, the patient has an impellent and there's no right heart cath. I like to use the right heart cath on all of these, even if selective. But if you're not going to use the right heart cath, Kenny, at the beginning of the case, Dr. Kenny mentioned what the EDP was, and that's important. The patient's EDP was 20. If you really want optimal pump performance, you want it to be about 15 to 20, so that's a good spot. So a lot of these patients are NPO. They could be dehydrated, and your EDP is only 2 or 3. You need to give that yeah. patient fluid. Otherwise, you're going to get suction alarms. Yeah. So if you're not going to do a right heart cath, at a minimum, do an EDP. It's very helpful. Yeah, I think that's a very important point. And we actually are looking into that aspect. You know, every case, uh, us, even if the patient had a PCI before, come for stage intervention, we always will go into the ventricle, no, if not, okay, not have to do the dye, but get an EDP. And we are looking into the outcome, the predict the the value of the EDP in subsequent uh, outcome with normal EF, Mildly reduced EF and uh, and low EF means what about diastolic dysfunction? Uh, and so we have 17,000 patient the being uh, which the being studied at present with the three uh, groups of uh, uh, low EF patients. Uh, I mean sorry, three p group of PCI patient. One with the diastolic dysfunction, EF is normal. Then mildly reduced EF and of course uh, significantly reduced EF. That whether EDP translate into I know though everybody asks that before Impella in the protect trial, if your EDP is 14, why are you putting Impella? Every live case, this is a common question. And uh, we went through yeah. that before, that your 14 will become 28 within 30 seconds when you start doing right. intervening these cases. So that was never the criteria. But yet, still that question is always asked that if EDP is good, do you really need Impella? So maybe Greg can answer it now. Anu, oh, that, what yeah. do do? Yeah. We dilated yes. that uh, yeah. tightest uh, area. What is the prox uh, OM? I mean, angiographically, yeah. I would not do anything. Yeah. Proximal actually, part I, of the actually, OM. Actually, this cross section is uh, uh, osteal OM. It's mm. kind much? of like a 1.9 close oh, section tight, area. Tight. tight. Yeah. Yeah. Tight. Less than 2.5. That's where it is. Yeah. 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 And vessel size is 2.5, yeah, 2.75. This style difference is lumen is 2.3. Yeah, 2.5 is a good uh, stand sizing. Okay, so we can go back then. Okay, and dilate. Will be a 2.538. Another one? You and mean all, 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 all still stenting is going to be, yeah, 30 is enough. Like uh, this white to white is a 30 millimeter. But it, yeah. if you cross over, so no, no, we'll just bring it there. Oh, sure. Yeah. So then it's a sari. We'll 38. Get, yeah, sari. 2.5, 38, approximately we'll dilate with the 3 -0. Now you want Give to me use a, a score flex? No. Uh, Give us a 2, 3, three, three score flex also. So with just to osteal lesion in our lab, we always try to modify with the atherotomy uh, technique, even if you do a little balloon. Yeah. Because I think what happened is, otherwise you end up three doing, doing a high pressure and a little more dissection. So, so the two, uh, whether uh, Wolverine and uh, or score flex are the uh, two atherotomy devices which we use in our lab. And uh, look, we again, don't look use the open and see yet. This part is not so much cost fun. It's mo mostly uh, lipid yeah, so and the fibers. It's not cost fun, but it's, it's an inelastic uh, lumen. Uh, you know, as you know that uh, uh, 
uh, at the ostium fibrotic fibrotic so just uh, kiski what do you think you are saying 33 or 38 38, 38. Uh, just a 30 huh? so, yeah 33 yeah yeah that's a good one 33 will take care yes okay yeah she kind of cause number uh, of that thick we we'll put 25 yeah. and post the proximal okay 25 the distal is barely 2 2.3 yeah. there yeah good yeah. so we are just going to cut so the so lost mean and uh, Yeah. So mean it a new so what mm. do you think uh, I mean here you're using OCT to make the decisions on which yeah, segments yeah. to treat and whether to treat. So what do you think of that versus uh can change I can change it back. Yeah. That will be another way. That is true. So but then after you do, do the pro, or maybe uh, you know many time IFR FFR better you finish the work and the area which you are concerned don't do it I mean borderline case but fill it, what I say that this pull back and all this is one way to do but best is you finish your work which yeah. you think it was a diseased and then do the ffr or ifr in the end to see whether you need to uh, take care of that intermediate lesion yes and i know you are yeah, uh, yeah that's really important so no i think if you've got if you've got moderate disease whether it's focal or diffuse and you're trying to decide whether to treat it then probably ifr or ffr is best but here you're definitely going to treat that distal om So now it's a matter of where do you land your stent and you don't want to land your stent in other, you know, a severe or moderate severe disease. So that's where, you know, Dan OCT is so helpful or Ivis is so helpful. So now you're extending your stent length to cover that osteolesion. lesion. Right? So I totally agree with that. And then whether or not you should use physiology post procedure to help you determine whether or not you're done. That's investigational and we're studying that in a in a 2500 patient randomized trial. called the fine gps of looking at uh, um ifr after stenting um to try to actually get an ifr to shoot for an ifr of 0.95 so 0.89 you know below 0.9 is ischemic but 0.95 is where it seems like you get optimal long term results take a sinus take a sinus so now kiski there was a calcium in the proximal cerc or no yeah there is slight but not that thick very focal at the osteo ointment Okay. Yeah, but not that thick. Right. The yeah. props, not our rule, rule of yeah. rule three. Of three. three. Some die again. Yeah. So we try to just yes. yeah, good. The stent is inside good. Yeah, good. Okay, okay. cop. Get, a Get us a 3O high 12. pressure. 12. 15. Any 15. questions from any of the fellows in the uh Yeah, yeah we have again. Go to the other view. So that was a uh, what was your diameter and length of that stent? Uh 2.533 because the distal vessel was yeah. 2.5 right. proximal or 2.8 yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we'll just dial it to the pro- proximal segment with the 3O. Your proximal was in, but smaller vessels, smaller vessels, long lesions are the ones where imaging is really important. That's where you really have to optimize the MSA. And those you know, are the ones. If you have a four-row vessel, you know that's the one where you say, ah, "Do I need the image or not?" You're probably not going to change outcomes all that much. But diffuse complex disease, calcified lesions, small vessels—that's where you can really make a difference. Good. Proximal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Going up. One of these. Since it's two point nine, I'm just going to twelve atmosphere. Eighteen, eighteen. 2.9 3 Okay get the OCT sure confirm now final take a picture first yes and if any question by nice. the audience uh, will do anything different right i asked yeah good so we we just show the OCT then we are done here maybe just show the uh, taking out the impella and uh, then greg you are ready with your lecture yep one more is when you guys decide to do about the right do we hit our die threshold yeah right we'll leave it you know with a lot of disease you see that uh, uh, you probably use... so you know what we do many time in these cases i bring them back in 3 months so let's okay. see your other things have healed nicely and then complete the job because rca i think is still there this is a good size it's a dom from pda point of view pda is coming from there so we'll bring this patient back in 3 months and uh, that okay. time complete the job of the rca yes so that was the plan good good
Okay. Kiski, ready? Yep. One second. So this is, I mean, this is a really nice case, you know, complex, triple vessel Come disease, press. all vessels, very long lesions, modern amount of calcium, sure. poor EF. And it shows you, well thought so out nice. plan, you know, imaging guided, impella supported. Yeah, look, um, it's still interesting. Uh, everything okay, now is it's stable. Native. You got plenty of time to make all your decisions. You're not being rushed. Ready? Okay. And, and that's our hypothesis of Protect4 yeah. is that, you know, Impella support was going to give you that time to let you do better revascularization, sure. do more complete yeah, revascularization. Yeah, okay. Enabling. One, one second. We'll, we'll find out. Calibrating. One second. Yeah, please, Cine, inject. Yeah, good image. Yeah, good. Good clearance. Good. Thinking. Okay. okay. Let's second. understand the imaging now. Sure. Doing the angiocorrelation. One second. So proximal to the distal. Confirm. Wait for correlation. Confirm. Ready? Okay. I got an image. So first I check the distal edge. The storage on the plug, but uh, there's no dissection, no Ready. malaposition. Yeah, now come to the proximal edge. Ready? Yeah, yeah proximal edge, yeah, exactly at the uh, at the bifurcation. And uh, this is a fluid stand. Yeah, looks well expanded. Yeah, it, of course, it's a tapering vessel. The distal area is kind of. Uh, but it's well opposed, right? Yeah, yeah, distal okay. is kind of full, but uh, proximal yeah. is, uh, yeah, four, six, four, seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it a tapering like vessel. Pretty good expansion. I mean, I yeah. think yeah. you've got ninety percent expansion distal. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. Because yeah, this cell reference is very tight. Yeah, it's a more hundred percent expansion. And that's focus. a good thing of this. Uh, yeah. Go 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 go. AI, all, distal. Oh, listen, distal vessel is one o three. Go back. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's true. And kind of still legible blood. Right. It's a two, super distal lesion. But uh, <laughs> like a visual, it's all very expanded. Okay, good. Yep. And uh, no, no edge complications. And proximal is on the dot ostium. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's at the at the bifurcation. Perfect landing zone. Okay. And uh, no uh, edge complications. Yeah, it looks great. Yep. Yeah. With that note, what I'm going to do for this case now, uh, because they already loaded him on uh, clopidogrel, we are just going to give 30 milligram of prasugrel, and uh, his weight is under 100 kilo, and we use only two stents. Uh, we'll give a five milligram. Bring him back in three months. And now, Andu, you are ready to take your catheter yes. out as well as uh, the impella. Yeah. Show it what you are going to do now. First, we take out the guide. Right? Yeah, so guide and the sheath. What about the sheath? Sheath will come out first and then we will do the impella. Okay, show and it about, to... guys, the screen. <sighs> Always. Top camera. No, not we centered. Draw. Just, yeah, yeah. Withdraw. Yeah. Always withdraw blood yeah. before you. No, still not take out the centered. Sheet. Give me the wire, right? Just okay, a little more, yeah, good. Now it's there, yeah. So it's, remember the sheath is from the different aperture. Yeah. It cannot be from the impella aperture, otherwise it bleed. We learned very early. Okay, so the sheath came out, done, and now we will remove the impella. Now, before taking out, you want to downgrade the impella? Yeah, it's going what on. Weaning is going on. No, no. P2, no, no, leave it. I know, one by one. Mm. It was P7 before. Then when did we decrease it? We decrease our, when we are ready? We were, they know. We were telling them. Pressure and the systolic pressure remains stable. At this moment, we are at P2 more, and our uh, systolic pressure is 110 with a mean pressure of 70. Okay. So now we are down, and then you take out. Once you take out, a lot of blood will come. Okay. Yes. We don't take out with a wire, just pull it out, right? Out. Yes. Okay. Let's do it now. So we pull it out of the, the P2 uh, so mode. Dr. Kenny, you mentioned that uh, closure is so important. Dr. Kaki, you mentioned that uh, you know you always use a contralateral axis to take a completion angiography picture. Right. Um, so we don't always do it for all PCIs, but all shock patients. We we like completion angiography at the end, and we don't always have that other access point. So sometimes what we do is uh, just put a, a microcatheter right. back in and, and take a picture. Right. Is that something you yeah. guys do? Yeah. So I've been probably me and Ted Schreiber are probably the the last two guys who are have not adopted single access. I see. We're so committed really? we're so committed to the completion angiogram and I know that you guys have come up with any way innovative ways to do that. But we had over twelve hundred patient experience our vascular access complication with up and over tamponade as a bailout belt suspenders approach is so low. 
that we have not really adopted it. But I know you guys do good work and the data suggests that single access potentially is safer because you mitigate the second access. But if you do, yeah, and, and I'm a big believer in the single access. Yeah. And if you if you do that, you know, angiogram through the micro Correct. puncture, yeah. then if you see you need to you can, you now do a separate access. puncture Correct. and then come up and over, that's what you do. Yeah, Manish, if you have time, maybe if you want to show them how we do that. Good. Yeah, sure. He needs a uh, thing. Is, he can um, anybody talks? Wait, one. Closure specialist. He can talk. He's a, he's a closure. Can yeah, he's a, he's, a, he's our access closure. Yeah. Um, wait, MCS wait, one second. Right. No, no. Well, uh, can you hear when he's talking? No, Kiski is done no. now. He can take. Kiski, give your mic to him. Take it out. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take that out. Okay. <laughs> okay now you can hear Manish. Yeah, Manish, can you uh, test? Yeah, we are at, at this level, we are weighing the impeller to the uh, P2 mode. And our systolic pressures are stable. We are at 110, 120 of systolic with a mean of 66. And uh, we are ready to come out. We are at stable pressure from last 10 minutes. So we remove at the P2 mode uh, under fluoroscopic guidance at the Keltic uh, and then we uh, bring it back to P0. Here, one has to be careful that the, your impeller anchors the sheath, and there will be some bleeding at this point, and we allow some back bleeding as well. Yeah, well, look at that bleeding. Yes. It should be actually P0 before you leave yeah. the ventricle, not P2. What's the value of having P2 before you exit the ventricle? It's so kind of P0, it's okay. Yeah. P2 equal to P0. <laughs> yeah, you, and then we... Get some retrograde flow. With the P0 in the ventricle, no? I guess no. that's a bad I mean, in the IFU, they want you to go to, there's a hypothetical risk of damaging the valve, but I don't think it'll happen, but then the IFU is supposed to go to P0. Yeah. And just to say that for our high-risk PCI, if you take last 100 cases, all 100 have been removed in the cath lab. And one exactly. patient got a balloon pump, yeah. but every case we remove it in. Should uh, they show the, the closure? Trial, we are done. And, the, and then we'll be just doing the Why closure. Do you need to see the closure or are we uh, done? Yeah, we'd like to see it. Okay. okay. Yeah, so. Manish, you're on yeah, the spot. Minutes, sir. So, we'd, but, but with like that note... the closure yeah. in the completion angio if Manish could show us his technique. Sure. No, completion uh, angio, how? We don't have other access. No, uh, from the micropuncture. No, micro from the micropuncture yeah. over. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Go, you guys go. go All right, so from procedure point of view, we're done. Now the no, important point is it. the hemodynamic. I can tell you, I know... Uh, Amir, you are very good with this contralateral too, but our vascular complication, which used to be about 1.2%, uh, sorry, 1 1.5 to 2% with the double axis, uh, even with the wow. 2.5 impella, has become close to 0.3% by using a single axis. Wow. Yeah, that's very but uh, one, <laughs> only one thing uh, I would say, issue is when you are doing complex, uh, real complex procedure and left main, if you are doing a calcific left main bifurcation, um, you know, when we are talking the real Sinai kind of cases, we do have issues with the seven French guide. Uh, I know this companion sheet is new, but with the older okay. sheet, we always used to have the impella and the guide interaction um, and unable to, you know, leave the guide where it wants to be and you know, doing left main bifurcation stenting and all that. That has been always some challenge. So uh, we are ready for yeah. the closure. Dr. Kaki, uh, if you can guide us, if, uh, if you do something differently, we will really appreciate that. So our both no, they want to see what you do. I'm, you I'm, you show okay. them what you do. So they were going yeah, to watch we're you. Learning, yeah. we're, learning, we're learning from you yeah. guys. We yeah, don't do yeah. this, so. OK. So. So we, uh, so our initial, the pre-close is we, uh, we keep sec uh, the securing one the second, white, white knot. Let me just put some proper blue towels. So they can see it well. <clears throat> yeah, and, and Manish just wet the pre-closes too, which really helps them yeah. slide yes. down and close. And then you Greg, you can also you keep talking uh, so that, you know. You so our pre-close, uh, the, the initial sutures, we have uh, we have made them wet again so that the sutures, they take well. Our wire is in the big sheath. Sheath has been uh, back blade. There is no thrombus in the sheath. It could be just cubic doubly sure. And uh, we are, uh, my uh, co-fellow will be walking the sheath back and while I will be giving after a back bleed, uh, after a little back bleed, we will uh, we'll pull the slack on the sutures 
So at this moment, my co-fellow Rakhi will pull the sheet back. And I will allow a little back bleed. Uh, after the back bleed, we have these sutures and we pull the slack. So we always remember which was our first deployment. And just while Manish is doing that, you know, the, the other thing I want to highlight is that the, the impella was connected to pressure the whole time. And I think there's a couple of benefits to that. One is that, you know, you get to see a reliable pressure the whole time. Micro sheet. Guide damps, and this doesn't. Yeah, but micro also, sheet. It prevents thrombus, which is what he was mentioning, kind of simplifies closure yeah. here. So it's very important in shock patients and in, when you're fully anticoagulated in the lab, not as much. So at this moment, we can see that we have just pulled the slack on the blue sutures, the long one, the, uh, the per close sutures are still not uh, tight. So, and we can see there is no bleeding, just the, uh, on the pulling the blue knot, blue sutures are just not goes over the vessel. And then we have take, we take the micro sheath over the, uh, uh, over the wire. So the, the percloses are pulled down, but they're not locked yet. And now this is just the, the outer portion of the microdilator, not the inner, because that would need an 018 wire. So over the 035 wire is just the outside of the micropuncture. What is that? Die? Yeah, that's going to ask. OK, uh, so what? Fluoro. Fluoro. OK, let me have it. OK. He's pulling it out? Pulling the wire out. And then what, inject? Then we inject and see, is there any dissection? Yeah, how is our vessel flow? Okay. Now micropuncture in and wire out and help yeah, it. Yeah, a little bit. Why don't you, hold one second, take this out. You don't need okay, this. Okay, okay. Ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Uh, let me go a little bit earlier. This is better? Yeah. Yeah? Yes. Okay. I'm going. Yeah. Go, inject. Okay, looks good. Good day to be Manish. Good yeah. job. Yeah. <laughs> good. good. Very nice. Well, okay. Nice so what happened? So we release it now? So we go again, we, we go with the wire back. Okay, and then? And before locking, we just want to make sure that our sutures are, uh, because we went with the micro sheath, we'll again pu push the uh, blue, blue threads again to be sure that the sutures are over the wire and we can feel it over the wire. So there is no bleeding as you can appreciate. Now I will ask my co-fellow to remove the wire. Okay, remove the wire. Good. Wire is out. And then we will lock the sutures one by one. So first suture has been locked, no bleeding. And while uh, our check is also, uh, our, uh, Will is also having a the look at the Doppler. Uh, yeah. Checking the pulse all the time. If you guys can hear the pulse that I'll flow. Yeah, we can't hear it. We'll take your word. <laughs> <laughs> now. <laughs> so the closure is yeah. perfect. No oozing, nothing. That looks perfect. Congratulations. Nice job, nice job Manish. Thank you, everyone.